Okay, okay, great. So I am recording this um, AMP1 Zoom review um, that we're having on the 20th at 11 o'clock. For those that can't come, um, and I've announced this to both the day section and the evening section, folks. So we'll see who shows up. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to open it up for questions. I don't have any preconceived agenda in terms of lecturing or anything like that. So I want to kind of see where you guys are and if there are particular topics in particular chapters you would like to talk about. I can pull up the PowerPoint and we can, we can go from there. So um, I have a question. So in chapter uh, hang two. On one second. Sorry. Okay. Great. I had, I had you muted, Elise, because I was talking to my wife about my car that's ready at the shop. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So in um, chapter two, I was just looking at the study objectives. Um, one of them that says it will be on lecture exam number one is metabolism and two divisions of metabolism. Could we go over that? Okay. Um, so you know that, that a lot of chapter two we've already been tested on in terms of the chemistry quiz, right? Okay. So you're talking about the, the, the other stuff that's going to be on the test. On, right. uh, coming up. All right, so let me just pull that list of objectives up and welcome, guys. We're just getting started. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep. Hey, yeah, great. All right. So bear with me here. Let me pull up the objectives so that everybody's aware of what we're talking about. Okay, everybody see the study objectives? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Elise, I'm sorry, go back to specific uh, number you wanted to talk about, 11? 11, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, this is one of those objectives that I mentioned, of course, that uh, will not be on the CAM exam, but will be on the CAM one of lecture. So what this is getting at is catabolism and anabolism. Now, if you want, we can we can pull up that section of chapter. I forget what chapter that was probably in. I think he took notes on that one for sure. That was in chapter 26, I think. Yeah. But the PowerPoint would have been in chapter, in chapter four. four, probably. There was a picture on it for the chapter four lecture. Yeah. So oh. how about if I, I do that? I'm gonna stop sharing this. And we'll pull up chapter four. <clears throat> chapter four, question six is the metabolism question. Okay. Oh yeah, yep, it's the same question. Okay. Uh, I'm downloading chapter four, just give me a second here. Okay, do you guys see chapter four PowerPoint? Okay, and so we're scrolling down to. I think it's on like 70. Um, well, I was thinking it was up here. I have slide 40. Oh. Do you see slide 40 on your screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so with respect to the two subdivisions of metabolism, as I said a moment ago, those two are 
anabolism and catabolism. That's what I was uh, referring to in that objective. Okay. Okay. Nope, that's helpful. All right. Um, so are there any more questions on what that was referring to? Uh, no, I just had a hard time finding it in chapter four. So I just wrote down the specific slides. So that's helpful. Okay. All right. So that could be, and I, again, I have to flip to the, to the book now. Is that chapter 26? It might be mentioned. Uh, I'm trying to remember where specifically it got into. That gets into car carbohydrate metabolism. That's glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and all that. But the overall you know, two subdivisions that I mentioned here, they could have been in chapter four. I just cannot remember. We bounced around a little bit. Actually, it could be in chapter two. They talk about dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis, which are the two reactions here, you know, that pertain to anabolism and catabolism, right? That's in chapter two on page 56. Okay. Remember the difference? One mm -hmm. involved the breakdown, one involved the buildup. Right, right. Yeah. So that's chapter two, the overall discussion of dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. And then I gave you some examples here, specific concrete examples of how this occurs in organic molecules, like you see here with carbohydrates. We can apply that to lipids, we can apply that to you know, peptide formation in, in terms of producing protein. All of these processes apply to all organic molecules. Okay, so does that answer your question about Objective 11, Chapter 2? Yep. Okay. How about other questions related to other objectives in Chapter 2? Again, I can, I can pull that up if you want to see that, or you should have printed that off. Um, here's the objective list. 18 and 19 are also specifically talking about topics we talked about in class that you could see on the test. And I put, you know, in red font to draw your eye to those. I think I'm good. I don't know if anybody else does. Okay. As long as we're in this chapter or Talking about this topic, are, is everybody okay with structure and function of enzymes? What is ATP? What is the ATP cycle? Are there any questions on that stuff? Because that's that's talked about here in chapter four, PowerPoints. Could we go over it? Which? Both of them. Well, I can certainly do that. Um, again, uh, you should have looked this stuff over, and so. Are there specific aspects of it? I, I, I guess rather than just do a whole lecture from scratch, I'm assuming you've looked at you know, enzymes and what active sites mm -hmm. are and know what those are. So come, come with questions, specific questions if you can, so we can make our time most efficient, I guess. I if mean, you're, if you're saying, I don't know anything about enzymes, you know, we can go over that, but my question would be, why don't you know something about enzymes? Um, the structure. Um, I was wondering if we could go over the structure of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so again, do you guys, um, we'll pull up the PowerPoint, which you should see in front of you now, right? Do you see the slide that says by enzymes, of course? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you got to know that enzymes are, first of all, proteins. 
yeah. that they have a three-dimensional conformation or shape, as do really all molecules. And its three-dimensional shape is extremely important when we think about how enzymes work. Because we've always said that whether we're talking about catabolic or anabolic processes, both employ the use of enzymes. Most of the time, we think of enzymes, say, as, as important in digestion, right? Mm -hmm. That's catabolic. That's the breakdown of bigger molecules into smaller ones. That's the hamburger you had for dinner last night getting broken down into carbohydrates and proteins and lipids, right? And from that, we extract energy, the cells do. But we've also stressed the, the notion that enzymes are involved in buildup as well. In fact, this slide shows it quite nicely where we're taking two substrate molecules, we're joining them to make a bigger, more complex product. And when that happens, it's the active site of the enzyme, that particular portion of the molecule where the substrate molecules literally fit, like a key fitting into a lock. It's a good metaphor to use. So the lock has a particular shape, doesn't it? Your car key won't open your apartment door or your house door. Only your house key does that. So you have to have proper shaped substrates that fit into the active site in order for these substrates to be converted into a product. Do you remember the analogy that I gave in class when I was talking about how enzymes work, how their three-dimensional shape is all important? What was the an analogy I used? I know I, I talked to you about it. Should have this in your notes. See what I'm holding up? Oh, the paper clip. Once you bend it a certain way, it won't go back to exactly the way it was before. Right. So the paper clip is uniquely designed for a particular function. That's to hold papers together. Enzymes have a unique three-dimensional structure that affects how they convert substrates. If you denature the enzyme, and you know what that means? Break it down. It, it, it's somehow influencing the shape. You might might end up degrading it. Yeah, you could denature it by changing the shape. Then you change its what? Structure, the whole thing. The whole you thing change gets changed. The structure, you change the what? What happened when I untwisted this? It didn't work, right? Right. If I unravel this, it's not going to hold paper together. So if I change the shape, if I denature the, the enzyme, I change the shape, I alter its what? Function. Function, right. Structure, function, relationship. We talked about that at the very beginning, our first class, I think. And I said, you're going to be hearing a lot about structure, function, relationships, whether that's at the molecular level or at the organ level, like the left ventricle is thicker than the right ventricle of the heart. Why is that? Because it has to pump blood throughout the whole body, right? Just always be thinking structure, function, relationships. The structure impacts the function. So the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme is extremely important because its specificity dictates what substrate molecules will interact with it physically, like we see here with the formation of this complex, and likewise, the ultimate formation of some product and a reusable, unaltered enzyme, which can combine with more substrate to make more product. If, if that's the case. So the shape of the protein, the shape of the enzyme is all important in how the enzyme works. And only certain shaped substrates will fit into this special region of the enzyme called the active site. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, great. And then again, we just talked about denaturation, what happens when you unravel the paperclip. So like when you heat an enzyme or you subject it to UV rays or, or uh, X-rays, any sort of um, 
outside energy source can potentially disrupt the shape like we see here. It sort of unravels the what's called the tertiary conformation of the protein to the point now where it's so radically altered, it's not going to be able to combine with substrate because the active site's been so changed. Yeah. So any questions on, on enzymes, how they work, how their shape impacts their function? Are you good with that? Okay. How about other specific objectives you'd like to go over or, or questions you have about any of the objectives? I'm, I'm assuming you've looked through some of these and you've been studying. Um, Can we go over um, like how ATP is produced? By that, are you talking about cellular respiration? Um, or are you talking about more general questions about what the ATP cycle is? More general like that, yeah. Okay, so here we're looking at the ATP cycle. And you can see the molecule here at the top. Remember what ATP stands for? Adenosine triphosphate. Phosphate. You can see the three phosphate groups, right, on this molecule. By the way, what does this what does this kind of look like? Does anybody recognize if we take one of those, uh, take those two phosphates off for the time being? This could very much resemble a nucleotide. If you think back to DNA, you have mm -hmm. the sugar, the base, and the phosphate group. So ATP is kind of a close cousin to a, to a nucleotide chemically. So this is the high energy molecule that our cells make when we introduce fuel molecules into cells, right? That's, that's glycolysis, degradation via um, those nine reactions, remember we talked about, and the citric acid cycle and electron transport. The idea is to make energy. That's the goal, to make ATP. Why does the cell need ATP? We know without it, it'll die. Well, what does it use it for? Anybody know? Give me one example of how a cell utilizes ATP. Active transport. Right, it's a good one. Pumping against the concentration gradient. Perfect. 40% of an, a cell's energy expenditure is thought to be due to active transport costs. So it's pretty significant, 40% of ATP a cell makes is used for active transport. Yeah. Can you think of some other ways in which a given cell in your body might use energy to perform some kind of work, cellular work? Um, I think like making glucose. Yeah. Yeah, making molecules, anabolic processes require energy. Yeah, that's, that's right. In order for a cell to make a protein, you have to link amino acids together, right? We talked about that protein synthesis, remember? That takes energy, so that's a very good one, yeah. Catabolic? That's that, that catabolic is the breakdown mm -hmm. process that makes the energy. But once you've got it, the question is, how does the cell use it? Replication, I guess. Um, yeah, cell division requires energy. That's that's a good one too. Yeah. How about muscle fibers? What do they do? In general, what does muscle do? Contract. Yeah, right. Contracts. Whether it's heart muscle or smooth muscle in the digestive tract or skeletal muscle that you're using to look up at the screen or to take notes. That takes energy. That takes ATP for muscle to contract. It actually also takes ATP 
for muscle to relax. We're not going to talk about that now, but you'll be hearing more about that when we get into the muscular system. So muscle contraction requires energy. If I'm a sperm cell, what do I need energy for? Travel to the egg. Right, for flagellar motion to find the egg and fertilize it, right? So these are all examples of how cells use energy. If you run out of energy, you're gonna, you're gonna die in essence. Cells need energy and they get that energy from catabolic processes. We talked a lot about carbohydrate catabolism as it applied to how glucose was broken down by our cells in glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport. Ultimately, that, those three processes allowed for significant ATP synthesis, the charging of the battery, right? We said on average, aerobically, we get 32 to 34 ATP molecules per glucose. Remember that? Yep. So speaking of that 34 to 38, in class you said 38, but the book uh, yeah. says 32 to 34. You yeah. told us to use 38. Which number do you want us to use? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with 32 to 34. And uh, the reason I'm going to go with that number is because when you look at the average amount of ATP molecules produced per NADH and per FADH2, those electron carriers, the buses, remember we talked about? I gave you a number initially. I said for each NADH, do you remember how many ATPs I said are produced? Maximum of how many? Was it four or six? No. Three. Each big each big busload of electrons will generate a maximum Two. of three ATPs. Yes, three. How about per smaller shuttle bus, FADH2? Two. I gave two, exactly. Those are the numbers I gave you initially. And if you use the three and the two, okay, per NADH and FADH2 respectively, you're gonna come up with a number 38 per, glu per glucose. But the book says, hey, it's not exactly a three to one or two to one ratio. It's more right. like 2.5 and like 1.75. So when you take into account that slight reduction in energy return, if you will, on, on, that, on those investments, of NADH and FADH2, that lowers the, the value from 38 down to 32 to 34. Does that, does that help, Nate? It does, but that probably got me the wrong answer <laughs> on the lecture quiz last night. Um, well, the reason that you got that wrong on the lecture quiz was because you didn't read the question carefully. It asked about how many ATPs were produced anaerobically. That was two. Two. Yeah. If it had said aerobically in your circle 38, I would have taken that. I, I forget how the question was worded. You know, I haven't corrected it yet. But uh, it, it, you bring up a good point, and that is just make sure when you read a question that you read it carefully. And I'm not, I'm not really out to, to confuse you, even though you think I am or to throw your curve balls. I'm, I'm not, I'm really not. But you gotta read the question carefully. Is there a difference between aerobic and anaerobic? Obviously, there's two letters in front of the aerobic <laughs> term. An makes it a totally different term, right? Without oxygen, anaerobic, as opposed to with oxygen, aerobic. So you just gotta be careful. The mind sometimes just, reads that question and doesn't see the an in front of aerobic. You know what I mean? So you just, just read the question carefully and double check your questions before you turn in the test. If you've got time, double check your answers. What I see students do every single semester, I can tell you, guarantee, just because somebody gets done in a half hour and they're up and out and you're looking up like, geez, they got done fast. Don't assume they did really good on the test. 
because they probably didn't go back and carefully reread the question or there could be lots of reasons. But just double check, double check your answers. Okay, well, we'll get off topic a little bit there, but um, does that help with ATP? Yes. Okay. How about other objectives or specific topics? So are we going to have to know the different RNAs, like tRNA, pRNA, and all that? You bet. We talked about them. You want to review that? Yes. Okay. So we're going to stay in, in Chapter 4 PowerPoint, which I think you guys are seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to scroll down to slide 90. And this is where we begin talking about how DNA and RNA work together in our cells to make proteins, like enzymes, for example. Enzymes are proteins. And here we introduce sort of the difference between DNA and RNA. And it's important to know that there are differences between those two types of nucleic acids. And I also here introduce the different kinds of RNA. And you were asking about, do we need to know what M, T, and R RNA do? And so this is, this is important. Um, in a nutshell, and we can go into detail if you want, I, I just don't know where you are in this process, but in a nutshell, the messenger RNA is what is made in the nucleus when one of the two DNA strands acts as a template or mold for the creation of the messenger RNA. And that's what's being shown in this diagram. Here we see that the RNA polymerase has come in, broken the hydrogen bond that existed between the, the uh, nitrogenous bases. And we've opened up the double-stranded molecule. And the enzyme also helps to add the new RNA nucleotides, which is what you see here sort of in the center with the light blue strip. This represents the sugar phosphate backbone. But look at the letters here, A, U, G, 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 C, U, A, C, C, and so forth. These are the complementary messenger RNA bases that complement the DNA bases on the right side here. Everybody see that? That's kind of hard to read, but you see the letters? This is called transcription. You're transcribing the messenger RNA, and that comes as a result of using one of the two DNA strands as a mold to create that messenger RNA strand. Is everybody good with how that's made or are there still questions? Are you good with this or other questions? I'm good. You, we can also watch this one minute, 20 second video if you want that shows it. I mean, you should have watched this. If you haven't, you should. We may not have watched it in class. I just cannot recall. I think probably our time was a little bit short and I knew that I didn't want to take time to watch it, but I hope you're watching these videos. You should be. So that's the end result, is the formation of this messenger RNA strand made in the nucleus during transcription. This goes out into the cytoplasm. Once it gets out in the cytoplasm, it will associate with ribosomal RNA, or rRNA for short. And what do I need to know about that, you ask? All you need to know about ribosomal RNA is that it is what makes the ribosome. That's all you need to know. Why is that important? Because what did we always say about ribosomes? What's their function? Uh, 
Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So this is where the protein is going to be constructed at the ribosome during translation. Would you be able to um, help us understand this part? It was number five on our question quiz yesterday. Um, how is it transcribed or something like that? I'm not understanding that. Question number five. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. It was it was similar to the picture that's on the screen now, and it gave us all the letters and asked us to transcribe. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. I know what you're talking about. Right. Okay. That was, um, let's see, let me pull that question out. Yep. So the question said, listed below is a segment of the template strand of DNA showing exposed nitrogen bases. In fact, I can pull this quiz right up here if you want. Yes, please. Go, okay, I'm gonna have to go retrieve it. Just hang on a second here. This is quiz number two. Pull that lecture quiz up. Okay, here we go. Okay, do you see the quiz? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so this is the question you were asking about. Yep. What it's saying is here is the template strand of DNA. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna go back to that PowerPoint for just a second. Sorry for bouncing around here, but I want you to understand what I'm asking. I'm giving you, do you see the PowerPoint slide? Yes. I'm giving you the far right-hand side here. That's what I'm giving you. This is DNA on the far right. Mm -hmm. This is DNA on the far left. We've separated it, the two, right? You understand what's going on here? Yes. I'm zipping the double strand, okay. I'm asking for what are the bases that are gonna complement the DNA bases? So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna wait for this uh, conductor to come by with his horn. This is the guy with the fetish I was telling you about. Comes by like five times a day. I cannot even be on the phone. <laughs> you hear the, the whistle? Yeah, we can hear it. <laughs> it's like my office shakes and my windows rattle and he just keeps on honking all the way past the building. I was kind of hoping for a rail strike, actually. There's no point even talking when the train comes by. So tell me what bases to put in these little lines 
that will be the messenger RNA strand that will be transcribed from this DNA strand. Do you understand what I'm asking for? I'm asking for the bases here. Okay, so what am I, what letter did you put down here? I put C. You put C? Yeah. What did other people put down? I'm just curious. I put down U. You put down U, okay. Anybody else want to vote? I would have put down U. Why not C? Well, you got to remember the base pairing rules, right? What were the rules? A and T go together, but there's no thymine in the RNA, so it goes to the uh, U. Uh, I forget what U stands for. Uracil. Uracil. Mm -hmm. Right. If you had a C, opposite it would be G. G, and that's that 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 occurs in DNA or in RNA. There's there's no difference. So you got that right, Nate. Good job. All right, so if this is a U, what should this be? Somebody else, a. give me a number, a letter. Tani, what do you think? Uh, a. Right, okay, how about this one? Anyway, a. G, this one. A. G, this one. U. U. C, A, U, C, G, A. Okay. 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 You understand? Yeah. I, what I did is I took the first three letters and I kind of like kicked them out, thinking that it was like, it's kind of like the picture on the lecture. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking that the three first three letters would be kicked out and it like continues. I don't know what you mean by kicked out. Like they get taken out. Why would you take them out? I thought they were being added to the chain that was, it's a picture that's farther down. Okay. I mean, if we can find that picture, maybe. The stop codon? No, it was, mm -hmm. you just had it a few minutes ago. Maybe it was up more yeah right there right here i thought like c5 how oh so are you thinking you thinking like the transfer rna gets kicked out yeah oh okay that's what yeah. i thought like i thought like mm -hmm. the growing polypeptide chain like those three would be taken and then like it keeps moving down the line mm -hmm. if that makes sense Okay, well, let's let's talk about the process. Um, yeah, I, I think you just need to understand what the question is asking. First of all, this whole process, this is the second part of protein synthesis. What you see on the screen, that's not transcription. That this comes later. That's so why you got you got to understand in your mind what the difference is between transcription which is the production of messenger RNA from DNA mm -hmm. and, trans and translation, which is when we use all three kinds of RNA to make the polypeptide. So you have to have okay. that fundamental difference in your mind that you know, you know what those processes kind of involve. And it, it, it's not easy, you gotta study it. So- That helps a lot, thank you. Yeah, okay, okay, great. So transcription involves the production of messenger RNA from the DNA. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on here in slide 97 and 98 and 99. And then in slide 100, we introduce the concept of if you look at these triplets or codons of the messenger RNA that just got transcribed, that when we get to translation, each of those codons codes for one of the 20 amino acids with, with the exception of the three stop codons, okay? So 61 of the 64 codons code for one of the 20 kinds of amino acids. 
And the reason we know that is, we, is because we have this table that you see here. Remember me asking you a question, how many different ways can you arrange four bases, U, A, C, and G, in triplets? I asked that question to both, to both lectures. I remember asking that. I said, it's a math answer. How many ways can you arrange four letters in triplets? The answer is four to the third power or 64. There are 64 possible codons. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Yes. Okay. So on that table, 4.2, you see all 64 possible ways you could arrange three letters, U, C, A, and G, in triplets. And if you don't believe me, you can count them up. I guarantee you there's 64 ways. So you can look up any of these codons and you can predict what amino acid will be brought in by a transfer RNA when its anticodon complements the codon sequence on the messenger RNA. And that's what this next series of slides kind of talks about. This, this is talking about how individual transfer RNAs come in one at a time, each carrying an amino acid. Okay. And I asked you in class, how could we determine the identity, the name, of amino acid number six, right here. How would we figure that out? Uh, G, C, A. Right, we look at the codon sequence of the messenger RNA. We look up G, C, A. And if you go to that table, G, C, A, there it is. Alanine is amino acid number six. Now, pay special attention to the anticodon, it's called, of the transfer RNA. It must complement the codon on the messenger RNA. So if you have GCA, which is what we do have here, its anticodon is going to be CGU. Obeying those complementary base pairing rules and remembering there's no T here because there's no DNA here, it's all RNA. But you're exactly right. You look up GCA in the table, not CGU. You look up the codon, not the anticodon. So what we're doing here is we're just simply bringing in one amino acid at a time via transfer RNA molecules. We're linking the newly added amino acid to the rest of them, and then we break the connection between the, the transfer RNA that was here on the left. We break that guy off. It, it leaves minus its amino acid, goes, pick up, goes to pick up another one. And if its anticodon matches the codon sequence down the line, it'll shuttle in whatever amino acid uh, ACG was. So this is the Uber. This is the this is like a taxi. Not to be confused with our buses of NADH and FADH too. So we continue until what happens? How long we do we continue? Right, exactly. Until we hit a stop codon. We hit either UAA, UAG, or UC, UGA. And then when that happens, we stop translation. We have made our polypeptide, we've made our protein, and we're done. So that ribosome simply slides across the messenger RNA, beginning with the start codon, AUG, month of August, abbreviation, and continues along until it hits the stop codon. Now, you might, you might wonder how long is that ribosome shift along the messenger RNA. Well, 
if a typical protein is made up of hundreds of amino acids, which it is, sometimes it's thousands or tens of thousands. I mean, some proteins are huge, but let's just, let's just pretend um, we're talking about a protein that's 300 amino acids in length. Just pick a number. That's a small protein. How many, how many bases did that ribosome slide through? If it's 300 amino acids, we're talking about 300 codons. We're talking about how many bases? Each codon is three. So 300 times three is what? 900, right? We're talking yeah. about a long, long messenger RNA. And that's a little protein. So are you getting what, I, what I'm trying to get at here? We're talking about a very long strand of messenger RNA. Hundreds, maybe thousands of bases in length. We're looking at just a little bitty chunk here to make it simple. This is, this is just baby steps in the process. Okay. So um, is, any questions on that? Okay, we get about 10 minutes. How about other questions, another topic? Uh, I had a question. Go ahead. Um, when we were talking about the semi-conservative uh, DNA replication, mm -hmm. um, I noticed when I was looking um, at it and reading about it, it says on one strand, the DNA polymers go towards the fork and then yeah. you have two polymers and a ligase that go away from the fork yeah. one going towards the fork does the job of the other three going away from the fork why is that or am i misunderstanding it no no nate kudos to you kudos kudos for picking up on that and, and the diagram here you see this dna replication yep okay so here you're seeing the individual nucleotides being added toward the fork. Here you see some being added away from the fork. I am really amazed that you picked up on that and you read that, and again, good for you. I'm not gonna get into the differences in how these DNA strands get replicated. It's beyond the scope of what we need to do in this course, but if you took a cell bio course, you would be learning about what's called the leading and lagging strands. And it gets complicated um, and it's not something you need to know for this course. Just know that when all is said and done, when RNA, or I'm sorry, when DNA polymerase and helicase and ligase get done doing what they're designed to do, the end mm -hmm. result is the formation of two double helices in the daughter cells that are genetically identical to one another. The way in which they're constructed is different. You are correct, but it's, it's not appropriate to go into that amount of detail right now in this course. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I was seeing that correctly. You, you were, but don't get caught up in those details. Okay. But it's a great question. Um, and then one other one that I was a little confused on, the, the way I thought I understood the s uh, slides on cell cycle, the DNA gets replicated uh, in S phase. I thought I understood it where it got done. It, it separated in metaphase. Um, because that's when it gets pulled to each side of the cell, but it actually gets duplicated in the synthesis phase and interphase and then gets pulled apart later. Can you clarify sure. that for me? Sure, sure. Okay. So in interphase, I'm going to just uh, go to that slide, which hopefully you see right there, right on your screen. In interphase, you're exactly right. We have those three parts. We have G1, S, and G2. 
And it's during the S phase, as you said, when the DNA undergoes that semi-conservative replication that we just talked about, exactly. But now you have to remember that even though we're looking here at chromatin inside this nucleus, this kind of purplish stick-like strandy looking stuff inside there, that chromatin is made up of DNA that is coiled around particular proteins called histone proteins. And I showed you a, a, a diagram in a, in a slide, I'm not sure if I'm gonna find it here, that showed the different levels of organization from the DNA all the way up to the chromosome. I just wish I could pull that up in my mind and where that is, and I'm not sure. It's somewhere in this chapter, I think. But anyway, if you could find that particular slide, this it'll it'll make more sense. But to your question, it's here that that process occurs of replication. So you're going to have much more chromatin present following S phase. So if you compare the chromatin, let's say at G1 versus G2, you're going to have twice as much chromatin at G2 than you will at G1 because of S in the middle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got all this chromatin in the nucleus in late interphase. Well, what happens during prophase, if you remember, is where that chromatin starts to supercoil into what you and I would recognize as discrete replicated chromosomes. So here you see in this diagram, a decomposing nuclear envelope, which we said was one important process that occurs during prophase, as well as the appearance now of chromosomes. And you can see those as these stick-like structures here in the photograph. You can't really see very well in this photo that each replicated chromosome is composed of two sister chromatids, but if you could, you would see that. Maybe, maybe that's where I'm confused then. So there's not just your two strands, your two sisters. There's multiples of these. There's there's many replicated chromosomes present in, in prophase. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. that's where I'm confused. But you have to understand that between interphase and prophase, that chromatin became even more compressed and condensed and again, I wish I could pull that slide up that I'm thinking of it's somewhere in your PowerPoint that shows the formation of the chromosome from the chromatin. It's just a function of super coiling processes that take place. Okay. But this chromosome, these, these replicated chromosomes, they're just a different form of what you had at the end of S when it was chromatin. You're just, you're just showing it in a different form. And in late prophase, some of those microtubules are gonna contact the central mirror regions of the chromosomes and begin to pull them eventually into alignment like we see with metaphase. And then as you said, in anaphase, we separate those sister chromatids after, after uh, duplicating the central mirrors. And so half of the DNA goes to the left, half of the DNA goes to the right, ultimately divvied between the two daughter cells in telophase and cytokinesis, and the end result is the two daughter cells, which now form new nuclear envelopes and the daughter chromosomes revert back into chromatin. Does that help? So when they go through the semi-conservative DNA replication process, then do they actually separate? I may, I'm really confused yeah. on what yeah. gets yeah. pulled apart. Yeah, yeah, that, that separation, that semi-conservative replication process is still when the genetic material is in the form of chromatin. So you're basically doubling the chromatin by the time you get to late interface. But you don't have chromosomes yet, but you have doubled the DNA 
Yes. That happened in S. Yeah. Right? That happened here. The end result was the doubling of the DNA, right? Right. So when you look at the DNA in G2, you got twice as much here as you did in G1 because you underwent replication of the DNA. So in S phase, they're just strands. They're just strands. Now, when they get pulled apart in metaphase and it shows it as an X, and then it gets pulled apart. Where, what is, maybe that's what I'm missing. How does it get back into the X shape, I guess? Well, that's where you gotta find that slide that I can't put my fingers on that shows the different levels of, there it is right here. Here's the replicated chromosome. It's made up of highly coiled DNA wrapped around these histone proteins. Now in, in interphase, it takes on this strand-like morphology. When you get into mitosis, it compresses to form the chromosomes. Each replicated chromosome made up of two sister chromatids, remember this? These are identical chromatids because of replication that occurred way back when. Um, back in S. So, so after the sister strands get made, they get joined back together until they get pulled apart? Yeah, basically. They, they, they do the replication of the DNA does maintain itself within the eventual chromosome that's produced. So I don't know if I, I guess I'm just not answering your question or I'm not, um, I'm not sure how to answer that other than to tell you chromatin in interphase, chromosomes in mitosis. Right. And I guess I'm just confusing how it gets from one to the other, where it gets pulled apart. It gets, it gets pulled apart. The sister chromatids get pulled apart in anaphase. And so half of that DNA that was replicated back in S, half goes to one daughter cell, half goes to the other. So they both- Right, but something keeps those, those uh, two strands together until it gets that far. They're not just split in half and duplicated and they're just randomly floating around. They're still kept together until they get pulled apart in anaphase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so not just, okay. I guess, you know, to, to really technically answer your question, you need to take a higher level cell bio where they get into the nitty gritties of, of, of that process, which is beyond this course. Uh, no, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got I've got twelve o'clock, so I think we need to probably wrap this up. I've got a student I'm need, I'm needing to meet at noon for a lab makeup, so I'm going to stop the meeting. I will um, again save this. It'll take 10, 15 minutes to upload, and then I'll I'll save it to the course shells of both the day and evening uh, section. Well, I Thank hope this you. was helpful to you. Thank you. Yes, it was. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, guys, we'll see you later. See you later. Thank okay. you. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Have thank a good day. you. You bet.